Hey everyone, it's George Kuros and welcome back to another monthly best of the Innovators Mindset podcast. I just love getting these short snippets from my incredible guests. They have so many great ideas on teaching, learning and leadership and personal stories that I think really resonate. And I love just kind of compiling this because it's a great opportunity for you just to get those snippets the best of from the month. And, you know, just share some ideas and hopefully when you appreciate some of the ideas and the stories that people share, please connect with them. I think one of the things that we often do in education and honestly, just civilization is we see great stuff and we just assume somebody is already sharing that they appreciate it. And then if everyone embraces that, then nobody actually ever gets appreciation. And I think as, especially in the field of education, we need to never assume people that are getting compliments, that people are getting credit. Go out of your way to take time to share that appreciation with them, especially with people um, that you're, you're learning from in your own communities, in your own connection, because you never want to regret not sharing that when it's too late, where somebody has left your organization because they didn't feel appreciated or God forbid, somebody is just not around anymore. And it's just something I wanted just to share as, as I'm sharing this, but I typically do these intro videos. And because we're in that time frame where people are either applying for jobs uh, or hiring for jobs, I want to share just three um, ideas for those who are hiring and for those who are applying. Now, some of you might be listening to this and saying, I'm out of education. And honestly, if that works for you, I don't think it's the worst thing. I think sometimes uh, we have to move out of these spaces. And if you're not happy, I don't think anyone should stay in any profession, education or else elsewhere, if they're not truly happy where they're at. So God bless you, right? If that's what works best for you, I'm all for it. But if you are in the situation where you're hiring, I wrote this post and you can see it in the description down below. And I want to just use it as a quick um, intro before we get into the best of. So if you're hiring for people in your organization, here are three tips that I want to share with you. Uh, the first one is look for people that will add to your, your school or district culture. What I mean by that, if you have, for example, a grade two position that's opening, are you looking for the best grade two teacher or are you looking for the best person for your organization because you might find someone who might not have experience teaching grade two but they would be a phenomenal addition to your staff and a lot of times it just kind of like someone leaves and then we just replace that position but the reality is maybe someone in your organization right now would love to teach grade two that's teaching something else or teach physics that's teaching something else and all it takes is to ask. So look for the best people and find positions that suit them and move people around. One of the things I used to do as an administrator, I would ask everybody on my staff nearing the end of the year, if I could um, give you your dream position, what would it be? And it was really a helpful process because sometimes people say, I actually have my dream position, leave me alone, do not move me. Some people say, I'd really love to teach this. And you start to learn and, you know, put people in positions where they, they feel they th will thrive and most likely they will. So look for the best people. Don't be stuck on, we have to fill this position that's left because sometimes you might not get the best person um, for your job. And sometimes it just takes some, you know, moving around. Uh, the second thing I want you to share if you're hiring is create a space where you bring out the best uh, in the people that you're interviewing. So for example, if you are in a space where you have like 15 people interviewing one person, just throwing questions at their way, that's never going to happen again, by the way. That's not a realistic thing. One of the best interviews I had, it was a principal and vice principal, and they made it so conversational. They actually gave me a sheet of paper with, a, you know, I think it was like 15 or 20 topics. And before I even got there, they said, hey, just look at this. Think of like five to 10 that you'd like to talk about and just let's have a discussion. And it was really interesting because they really put me in a position where I could talk about what really my strengths were, what I was really passionate about. And I think, you know, looking back at what I said for the first one, it was really interesting because they saw strengths that I had that maybe their school needed, but it was just conversational. I actually really, it was weird. I remember like laughing and crying in that space because I felt so 
comfortable and we want people to see themselves working with you not where it's all stuffy and people don't feel comfortable it's just a bad way to really kind of promote our own culture and people that might not take your job if that's the feeling you create with them it's not great word of mouth for your organization and so the third one i uh, um, i want to share with you if you're hiring is make every person better from the process whether you hire them or not and here's what i mean let's say you have uh, one position you interview four people it is so weird to me that people will not get a job and not hired and the person that interviewed them or the main person that won't talk to them sometimes they don't hear from anybody that is such a bad reflection on any organization the thing that i would do when I was in a position where I would hire, um, obviously we'd offer the person the job and make sure they accept it. And then, you know, then we would contact the other people that didn't get the job. But I would give them feedback on their interview because here is my thinking. They're gonna be educators. They're gonna be working in school somewhere. So I wanna set them up in the best way possible. I remember one teacher specifically, I said, hey, here's things that I thought were really good. Here's what I think you should improve on. And as you're thinking about this, if you get another interview, here's what I would do different. And just kind of think about this. And it wasn't meant in a critical way. It was meant in a way of support. What was fascinating to me, we talked for about an hour. This is someone who I did not hire. And within about two weeks, she had contacted me, said, I got a job and I'm going to tell you straight up. There's no way I would have ever got that job if you didn't actually give me feedback. And I use all that feedback in the way I presented myself and how I answered questions and it really helped me. She contacted me years later, thanking me again because she had a job, job that she truly loved. And so when we're working with people, understand that every time you're gonna somehow, that person is gonna maybe work in your school, work in your district, work with maybe your own children. What you want them to be the best they possibly can, whether you hire them in that moment or not. So just those three things, and I'll go through them really quickly again. Look for people to add to your school district or culture, hire the best person, and then secondly, help bring out the best people in the interview process. And thirdly, make every person better from the process, whether you hire them or not. And now if you're interviewing for jobs, here are some quick tips that I shared, and again, all this, I'm just kind of reading the tips. I'm not even reading what I wrote because I want to kind of see uh, if I still think this is information that's relevant. But if you want to dig deeper, not only is this link uh, available in the description down below, but there's links that if you're applying for jobs, hopefully they help you as well. Uh, the first thing I said is present yourself for the job that you want, not the job you have. And a lot of times people think about this as how we dress. And maybe that's part of it too and whatever. Here's the advice I give you. So for example, I remember applying for an admin position and my mentor, Kelly Wilkins, had said to me, when you're creating your resume, because you're applying for a leadership position, but currently you're a teacher, go find what the standards are for leadership in the school district. And what you need to do is actually share the information and the abilities that you have that are already meeting the leadership standard. Go through that process and look and say, hey, as a teacher, I'm already doing these things that you expect of your administrators. And so I looked at that and said, oh, I'm doing this here. I'm doing this here, how I communicate, how I connect. That was really helpful advice. And it actually helped me feel more comfortable applying. It wasn't, well, I've never done this job. Uh, you know, how am I going to be successful? It was, oh, I actually do many of these things in my current job and Basically, I'm a no brainer once you hire me because I already do this stuff that you're saying is the expectation of the job. So look at what you're applying for, look what the standards are, what people expect, and actually, whether it's tailing your interview, tailing your resume, your portfolio, to show I'm already doing these things, here's evidence in my current position why I'm ready for this next step. The second point I wanna share is continuously focus on key points that bring out your, your best in the interview process. Here's what I mean by that. Think about three or four things that are your values and principles uh, in education. So for example, one thing that is my central part is I truly believe how we connect in our classrooms, how we build relationships. That creates a culture where we can really push our students, push our colleagues, where they know they're supported. That is really foundational to me. So 
I ensure that somewhere when I have those three points, whether they're written down, whether they're memorized, that your question, I'm somehow getting back to it. Now, it seems like a little, you know, political thing. You know, sometimes politicians, whatever question they ask, they're going to say their things. I guess maybe it is a little bit. But I think you want to make sure that the things that really bring out the best in you, you want them highlighted. Now, obviously, they have to be relevant, right, into what you're doing. But even just kind of having like, what are my biggest strengths? What are the things that I really want to bring to the table? Highlight them before you walk into an interview process, before you apply. Make sure people know that um, within the questions that you dare when you, uh, when you connect, right? The last one I want to share with you. And I wrote this. Closed doors often present some of the best opportunities for the future if you're willing to embrace them. So I talked earlier about... <laughs> when you don't hire somebody that you should still help them become better through the process. And this is something I really try to do as an administrator, but I think part of it was I did that because it was done to me when I was in education. I remember one of the first jobs I applied for, I was very new to the profession, hadn't had a job yet, and I wanted to grow and I wanted to get better. So I actually remember, um, they, they didn't hire me and uh, they said, hey, you're a great candidate. And I was kind of like, whatever, and then you would have hired me. That's what I was thinking in my head, but I didn't say that because it probably would have looked really bad. So what I actually said in the process uh, was like, hey, it's so, I, I appreciate the opportunity. It really matters to me. And I think those were, even when things don't go your way, how you present yourself. But about one to two weeks after the interview, I contacted the superintendent because it was a superintendent who was actually doing the interview for this particular teaching job. I said, hey, uh, is it possible that I can just have a conversation with you because I want to be better. I want to grow. And are there things in the interview that I actually could have done better? Is there things, advice you can give me because I, no matter where I go, I want to do a good job and I want to grow, I want to get better. And simply making that call it actually, he said, hey, I actually was just thinking about you. We've had this emergency position open up. Would you be willing to take it? I said, yeah, I would. I would love to. And his enthusiasm for my willingness to learn led me into that space. So take those opportunities when things don't go your way. How do you connect with the people after? How do you learn and grow? How do you take some of the misfortune that you have in that process to turn it into a learning experience where you become better where it leads to another open door so th those are three points I'll, I'll go through them really quick again present yourself for the job you want not the job you have think about what they're expecting in that position and show how you're already doing it currently the second is continuously focus on key points that bring out your best in the interview process really simple focus on what you're really good at uh what you want to highlight, have it written down, lock it in your mind before you walk in the interview, make sure it gets highlighted. And then the last one is that sometimes closed doors often present some of the best opportunities for the future if you're willing to brace them. Not everything's going to go your way. Some of the best opportunities I've ever had were because of jobs I didn't get. And whether it was for learning opportunities, I was actually just talking the other day about a job that I didn't get. And I was so upset. I thought my world was going to end. And now when I look back, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if I would have got that job. And I love what I do. I feel truly blessed uh, to be able to share, connect, and work with educators all over the world. And if I got that job that I was so destroyed that I didn't get, I would have never had that opportunity. So just some advice as you're hiring or looking for new opportunities. I hope it can help somebody. As I said, it's in the description down below. Now, enough of my blabbering. Let's get to some really amazing guests. Welcome back to another best of monthly edition of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. One of the things I do just kind of behind the scenes of the podcast, uh, I never just meet the guests and press record. We kind of just talk and I kind of learn. And we were talking about kind of focusing on learners, not just students, and seeing that as adults. And you, you said something really powerful, and I, I hope you can share with everyone here, because I think it's 
something that's really meaningful, especially in education today, where, you know, people are, there's a lot of people feeling very disillusioned with education, right? Uh, you can see a lot of people are leaving the profession, but you talked about helping people find their purpose. And so can you talk a little bit about what you shared with me? Cause I thought that was really powerful. And I think it's a really important message, especially in the world today. Well, I mean, um, in Carroll County, our vision is to be recognized as a, as a uh, premier school system. But we had had that out there for a number of years, and, it, it, and we still had a void. We had a gap. Uh, you know, we still didn't quite do what it needed to do. And so we get entered a discussion about, well, that's our vision, and we got a mission, but what's our purpose? Why do we get up and come to work every day? You know, why do we uh, – face the things that we face, deal with the issues we deal with or the problems or whatever it may be, you know, what's our purpose? And uh, so we had some deep discussion as a district. And at the end of the day, what we determined that our purpose is, is to positively change lives. Uh, so when we talk to our, our people, you know, we ask the question, you know, what are we doing today with, with every person we interface with to positively uh, impact that person to make that life um, better to enrich them, to lift them up or whatever it may be. So whether it's a student, a uh, fellow staff member, a parent or community member, it matters not. Uh, all of them deserve for us to give them the very best experience we can give them and to positively enrich their opportunity so that their trajectory in life is improved. Mm -hmm. So our purpose is to positively change lives. Uh, and that really is the statement of what we want our culture to be about here in Carroll County Schools. I got to ask you this question because it, it is really like, you know, I hear about it sometimes too. And I'm just, there is something that is really so evident with you that I find just, you love teaching. Like That's you, right. like I, I can just feel like when you talk about it, when you share practices, but you also, you also left the classroom and do this stuff. It's like, Oh, you like, like, how was that transition? And does it mean you like, does it mean you're like, yeah, but I was sick of it. Like, what does that mean? Cause I think a lot of people feel that once you leave the classroom, it's like, you no longer love teaching. And I think that's totally wrong. And I, I guarantee there's some people that are like, I'm out, like I'm doing anything yes. else, but yes. that's not something I feel with you at all. Right. I feel that you have this love, this passion, and you want to truly help educators not only become better, but find that love that you have. Like, am I wrong there? Like, how do you see that? Cause I, I like, I, I feel that how much you love teaching just in the conversation with you. And it's absolutely, it's, it's infectious for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. It is the greatest profession on the freaking planet. Can, can I say freaking on this podcast? Is that yes. all right? Yes. In, Texas, in, in Texas, in a specific district, I was not allowed to say freaking because it, it alludes to something else. So I needed to make sure that <laughs> right. this was it. I got you. Yes. I just, I, there is, it is the greatest profession and I know that we're going through a lot, but, but as a teacher right now in public education, any education at this point, but mm. yeah, the passion to be in front of children, I, I will get a little of a to talk amongst yourselves, but I do get a little emotional about it because I love this profession so much. I want to preserve public education yeah. and I want teachers to realize, how, yeah, I'm getting all, look at me, I'm getting all weird, how amazing it is you don't realize the gift you have to be in front of children and you don't realize the gift you have to be amongst children and this right. camaraderie and this collective agency of people coming together to educate children, which in turn will have children with better lives through education, through mentorship, through mm -hmm. believing in them, through high achievement, but also meeting the children where they are plus one. And this ability to do that in a setting for seven hours a day, as tired as it can be, mm -hmm. but finding the strategies to reach each child individually but then finding yourself within that process and saying, what can I do to better children in turn the community, but myself as a leader, that's what it is. And then to make that decision to leave was simply because people kept on saying, the impact you make 120 kids every year for the past 15, 16 years is great. But now the impact you can make for thousands based on what you offer that works. So go out, go forth, go, go. So I was literally pushed out of the nest uh and instead of me going, no, but I want to stay. And that's what made me say, okay. And I'm still now 
close to the kids from 2013, 2014, and 2015, who I'm not even a godmother to some of the kids and just just traveled with some of the kids and went back to their home countries because the relationships, the empathy, the compassion, but also the TLC squared, tender love and care and tough love culture. That's the stuff that made me say, I got to share this with other people. And I call myself a, a Ralph Lauren teacher. Okay. You know how Ralph Lauren throughout the eighties, I mean, it was started in what, right. somewhere, but then 83, it got really big. It's still considered like educational philosophies are classic, but they've modernized, but still right. stayed classic where it doesn't go out of style. I'd like to say what I did back then still works, but I still enhance right. it with just a few things to modernize, to meet the needs of the 21st century kid now in 2023. And that's kind of how I think it's working. And it is because I'm also listening to the needs of the teachers and the students of 2023. A lot of people hear the term lead and they think it's this is an administrator book and it's totally not that. So who is this book written for? I, I think it's written for anybody that's looking to just empower others. Honestly, with leadership, it, it, for me, it's, be, it's, it's being able to build capacity. And and there were this book was you know it's funny when you get these projects that when you're stuck like it unsticks you and you know we had yep. been talking about this book for literally for years and i had been doing you know i, I didn't want to write but i kept doing all these videos all of these one minute walk to work videos just talking about how we lead from different places if it's the classroom or if it's the playground if it's the court if it's yeah. the field, if it's the whatever the case may be, it's the district office. And I kept talking about how we lead in different capacities. And I love doing those. And I love that the response yeah. that we were getting from people on those. And all we did was take those and just kind of keep, you know, put them into a deeper dive. And it made me feel awesome because I would, I would honestly, I'd show up in at, at school at five o'clock in the morning, just ready to write about the things that I believed in, in those videos. It just gave me purpose. Mm -hmm. And every time when I would come to, to school and start writing, I would find more purpose, not only in that moment, but when I walked out into school, I found more purpose in walking through mm -hmm. school because it focused me on, on what I was doing, which then made me feel like if that was doing it for me and I was writing it, Man, I'm really hoping that it'll do some, that, that same thing for people when they read it as well. Yeah, and I was going to actually ask you, like, what inspired you to write this? And obviously, you know, the stories from your school, right? Seeing the yeah. stuff that you do oh. every single day. And I, I've been a, a huge proponent for years for, for blogging, but more open reflection. I think a lot of times when people look at blogging, they, they think just about writing. Whereas I see it as a much more holistic. You can do video in there, you can do different things. It's kind of just a one-stop shop of all my thoughts. And when you're kind of talking about that, I, I don't, I and maybe I'm wrong. You tell me if I'm wrong on this. There's no way that book's happening if you don't do those one minute reflections, right? Those, those walk to work reflections. And like, how is that so crucial to your process? Because, you know, I, I have my answer on like why that's helped me write, kind of expand on my mm -hmm. thoughts. But like, how did that help you? Because people just see the little snippets, but they mm -hmm. those snippets added up over time led to this incredible book. Yeah, well, I think the first two, two ways, two, two reasons. And the mm -hmm. first was that it was a bunch of stuff that I screwed up. And I didn't want anybody else to screw up the stuff that I screwed up. All right. That yeah. was the, that was, the, that was one of the things, but the second thing, and probably the most important thing for me is that every one of those walks is authentic. It's always mm -hmm. something that happened. It wasn't me being philosophical. It was just, this is what happened. Here's how I can help you. This is kind of what you could do tomorrow to make sure that things right. feel a little bit better for you and find some purpose in the work. And that's really, that was it. I mean, honestly, I felt like if we could get people to a place or help people to a place that A, they know their value, but B, they can help themselves create some momentum for themselves and for the people that they serve. Now, all of a sudden, now you can get some momentum along the way. So I think that's kind of it, the authenticity of what it was, was a huge, was probably the biggest piece. But the second thing is, you know, I screwed up a bunch of stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm not perfect. And the willingness to put myself out there and say, you know what? I treated this person poorly. That's what I did. And I've, yeah. and I, I, have, I tried to say, I was sorry, but guess what? It didn't help, <laughs> you know, I, and yeah. I lost that person in terms of having them as an advocate in school. And so don't do that. <laughs> like right. figure out a, way, a different way to do it. And, and hopefully uh, along the way we've, we've helped people kind of uh, think about things a little differently.
Well, the authenticity, I think it really, really matters. And mm-hmm. like you are currently your superintendent and you, you yep. just, uh, you know, you just resigned and, and I know that they're in very good hands with the new superintendent coming out. Uh, but one of the things that I really, I know, and it's kind of weird because I think people kind of appreciate the opposite. I appreciate how informal and relaxed those videos are because it, it kind of gives, I don't know, permission, but it makes people more, feel more comfortable, make them themselves. Cause I've seen a lot of superintendents, they got like soft lighting yeah. and they got, <laughs> you know, it's like they got a production crew doing this stuff. And then they're like, you need to do this in your class. And you're like, I don't have that. Yeah. I don't have a team. So mm-hmm. that's that's not happening, right? Uh, one person I'm gonna give a little shout out here. <laughs> Let's say a shout out. So do you know? So do you know the subbing superintendent? I don't know no. her name. Look her up after this. Okay. She's on TikTok. She's a superintendent in Texas. I honestly do not even know her name because she just says she is like, "Hey, the subbing superintendent here." Mm-hmm. And I don't know how that name. I don't know if she's subbed in for a superintendent. I know she's a current superintendent. But she's okay. just like chilling and telling stories and talking about what's happening. And so mm-hmm. many people resonate with that. And I think it shows, you know, people in a much more authentic way. Specifically, when I hired a principal, I hired someone probably as different as me than me as possible because I didn't need, I already had me. I don't need two me's. I need someone right. who, you know, who, what, and she was incredible with data. I, I'm not doing that stuff, right? Whereas, you know, the principal I work for, when I was a assistant principal, he was good at that stuff. So is there, you know, I don't, and maybe there's something different in, you know, Florida leadership, or is that something that, you know, people look at? Like, hey, what is the strength of this person in this? Because a lot of people are kind of turned off by, going into admin because they say, well, that's, I have to do those things. I'm like, not if, that's not if you're not good at them, right? A good principal will put you in a place of strength, not just say, this is the assistant principal's job, whoever gets it. So how do you see that? I, I, no, I agree. I think it, you know, what, what I would look for is just someone who would best, um, and in a sense, compliment me and balance things out. Um, because like, Prime example is oftentimes uh, for principal and assistant principal, when you become a principal, you no longer have bus duty. You have car duty. Right. Bus duty's got the referrals, car duty. I mean, how many times would you get a car duty referral? I mean, that's, you know, that. Right. But but like for me, I don't mind the bus part of it. I don't mind having to ride on a bus if I need to for student behavior or whatever. And just where those strengths are like data it is a strength of mine, but um, if something else needs attention or, you know, if there's something else that I need more, like I have more of a math and science uh, background right. and, but there might be someone that's got more of the, the ELA social studies side of things. And I'd want that kind of balance because again, we always talk about the whole child. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the whole school. Right. And how to best balance things out for the support of our staff. And that could even trickle down to like we have instructional coaches. We could have someone, you know, oversee math and someone oversee uh, language arts and be able to tap into the strengths. Um, our county uses the um, uh, the Clifton uh, Strength Finder and right. we have like our top five. And I mean, I'm one that would always want to see even within our like um, PLCs within our grade levels or even within our um you know, leadership team, what are our strengths? What are our top five strengths? And because I, again, that should really balance each other out because everybody, if they're all on one side of things, you're never right. going to, you want that kind of, I'm not going to say conflict, but you want that discussion. You want right. to make sure all sides are considered and you're not going to have that if you <clears throat> hire in a way where it's going to just complement things or do things that you're already good at doing. It's got to right. be that, you know, more of a balance. So that's that. what I would look for. And, and everyone who's listening, um, if you're assistant principal right now, if you're a principal, if you're wanting to go in those roles, I've actually listed, uh, there's a link to an article called Four Attributes of a Great Assistant Principal. I just pulled it up uh, while I was listening to Dan and he, he knocked off some of the things that I talked about um, several years ago. So I'm excited. Uh, if, if people are interested in reading that, check it out down below. The last lesson um, I want to share with you, and this is one that I've, kind of re-embraced is, and you know, I used to do this a lot more than uh, I have in in the past couple of years, but I've started to do it again, is to advocate for yourself. And what do I mean by that? When I first moved to uh, Parkland School Division, that's the last um, school division I worked with 
on contract for a, a, a long period of time. That's where I became a teacher or where I didn't become, that's where I started teaching. And then I became a vice principal and a principal and I worked in central office. I had a really great time there. There's a lot of great people uh, that I've met. And I'm still connected with uh, through that time. And on my very first day, I remember they had welcomed new teachers. And it was really an incredible experience because when they were welcoming these new teachers, the superintendents were there. And like, not just the superintendent, but there's like associate superintendents, deputy superintendents, all these people. And I really appreciated that because I had spent several years in another school district. I never met the superintendent ever. They would not know me from a hole in the ground. Yet on my very first day at this school division, I met the superintendent and I met all the associate superintendents, which was incredible to me. Um, it was just it tells you something about the culture of that place and, and why it really matters. And so there was one associate superintendent and I kind of got the, the feeling that he was um, doing stuff with technology integration, things like this. And I was on a temporary contract and I remember saying, I, I kind of pulled him aside. I said, hey, can I talk to you for a second? He said, absolutely. I said, hey, I know that you're doing a lot of technology stuff. Just so you know, uh, I actually did a lot of stuff with technology, technology integration in um, my own, my last school district. And if there's any way that I can help you, if there's any w uh, services I could provide um, to the school division outside of my role as a teacher, I would love to do that. So please keep me in mind because I would love to kind of help if you need me to volunteer, to lead some sessions, things like that. And I think he was kind of shocked that I would just went on my way and like basically, you know, offered up my time. But I, I, had, I had committed that when I went there that I was going to recreate myself. And I think every time we have a new opportunity, we have an opportunity to recreate who we are, which kind of I'm talking about, to be honest with you, as I'm listening to myself myself 